Today is Monday, December 16th, 2019. It is 5.04 p.m. and we are at the John Zahn Community Center at 35 Pleasant Street in Greenfield, Massachusetts. This is a special meeting of the Greenfield School Committee. Can we have a roll call, please? Member Johnson. Here. Mayor Martin. Here. Member Hollins. Here. Member Ward. Here. Member Nunez. Here. Member Ekstrom. We are missing Member Karen. I believe she's arriving a little bit later. Sounds good. So we have a quorum. Uh, we are going to move immediately into executive session uh, for the purpose of reviewing executive session minutes with the intent of later on in the agenda releasing some executive session minutes into uh, to the public. Um, this is, this corresponds to MGL C38217 to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements. Um, and this is executive session minutes from October 9th, 2013 through November 18th, 2019. Is there a motion to enter into executive session? So moved. Moved by Member Johnson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Ekstrom. Um, roll call, please. Member Johnson. Yes. Mayor Martin. Yes. Member Hollins. Yes. Member Ward. Yes. Member Ekstrom. Yes. Member Nunez. Yes. All right. So we are in executive session. We'll go into the other room and then come back in about an hour. Okay, thank you, GCTV. So hi everyone, we are back it, from executive session. It is 6.10 p.m. Um, and we intend to stay with our public business um, until 7 p.m. This is by vote of the committee to enter into executive session at 7 p.m. for um, a moment. So just to confirm, we do have a quorum present here. We are joined by Katie Karen, who came a little late. And, <laughs> hey, it's fine, no judgment, just saying. Um, so we're gonna jump right in with the public comment. Is there anyone here from the public that is here to comment today? Okay, seeing no one, we will move forward on to reports. Um, I realized that there were no, we neglected to offer a, com, a policy subcommittee report at our last meeting. Um, did we want to comment briefly on the work of the policy subcommittee? <laughs> no. I know. We can move to table it too, it's fine. I don't think the work is continuing. I was not at the last meeting. Um, uh, Member Johnson was the chair and the work has continued, just as it has been. Great. Um, Superintendent, do you have any comments today? Good evening. Uh, first, I apologize, my voice is not my usual state, so sorry, but many of us are sounding like this, tis the season, I guess. Uh, first, for everybody watching the weather, there's gonna be some weather tomorrow. Given that we're in school committee just now, we're going to um, wait until after school committee and check for updated conditions. We always try to tell families as soon as possible, but you can't always tell the conditions the night before, and we don't wanna call it unnecessarily. So we will make a decision as soon as it's clear uh, what the conditions will be for tomorrow. There's people that are rallying, I think, in the audience for or against a snow day, so. We'll make the decision in coordination with DPW and the safest possible conditions and we'll inform parents in the usual ways. I do also want to make a public announcement that is a bit bittersweet. The Four Corners community today received news that the Four Corners principal has accepted a position outside of the Greenfield Public Schools that's in alignment with the principal's professional goals and is um, a long-term goal of his, so I'm both very pleased for him and his family and supportive of that decision, and of course, sad for the Four Corners community 
and for the Greenfield Public Schools. Mr. Toomey has been with us as an employee for the last five years. He's been a teacher, uh, part-time principal at the Academy of Early Learning. He worked in central office with myself, and of course he's been at the uh, Discovery School at Four Corners as a principal for the last several years. So we wish him all the very best. He is working with us on his transition as we begin the search for a permanent replacement, and he will, will be with us after the break. His last day will be Friday, January 3rd. So, uh, we thank him for his many years of service, including as a parent here in Greenfield, and uh, we wish him the best. And we will be looking for both parent and teacher uh, representatives as we move through that process to appoint a new principal, and we'll be in touch with the community. I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, Member Ekstrom, is there anything to report on the collaborative? I don't think we, we touched on it last week. There's nothing to report. Okay, and Member Hollins, last but not least. Um, nothing new. Thank you, that would be for planning and construction. Okay, thanks everybody. So we'll move on to our business. We have the Special Education Parent Advisory Council here to give us an update. Yes. <gasps> what? <laughs> so four. much talk about minutes today. Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't think we should um, skip over it. Let's go ahead. Is there a motion to approve the draft minutes from September 23rd, 2019? They are in your packet. And is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Yep. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Susan Farber. Oh, I'm sorry. Abstain. Abstention from Mayor Martin. Uh, were there any no's? Okay, thank you. Um, I did receive minutes from our last meeting. I'm gonna go ahead and hold off on those. Um, I know that our committee likes to review the minutes, so I want to be sure that uh, people have time to review those. I received them just before the meeting today. Thank you so much, Susan Farber, for um, being so quick with those minutes. It's really great. Um, okay, so moving right along. We have the Special Education Parent Advisory uh, council here to give us an update. There Member is. Nunes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Chair Nunes, what about public comment? Do we? We we went through public. Oh, comment. I'm sorry. Yep, Thank it's you. okay. Um, so we have a one-page document in our packets here, and if you all want to kind of, if you all want to come on up, it'd be great. Um, and I will simply yield to all of you and the director of people services, Matt Holloway. Um, and perfect. <laughs> Not so much. Okay, super. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, so we are the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, um, and we have a very busy year ahead of us, and we have a lot of things that we had accomplished kind of last year and that we've already started working on for this year. So um, Before you jump in too deep, could you tell us your name and if you have a particular office or title within the group? I'm Crystal Zimmer, and I'm the secretary of the CPAC. I'm Mary Traver, and I'm a co-chair. And my name is Autumn Mercier, and I'm a co-chair as well. Do you need to introduce I'm, I'm Matt Holloway. We've met. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the pupil services director. He's the star. No. <laughs> All right. Um, do you want to talk about accomplishments? Sure. Um, so some of the things that we have been working on this year, we, we haven't had a lot of, um, thank you. We haven't had a lot of activity, um, partly because we were, um, we changed our meeting 
dates at the YMCA from the first Wednesday to the fourth, which this year fell on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and Christmas Day. So the Y very graciously accommodated us with a uh, second Wednesday meeting in between those two dates, but the first meeting of the year was taken up with elections and the second with bylaws, and the third was that <coughs> meeting I just referenced. So we've had a, a bit of a slow start, but uh, the past accomplishments that I want to bring our attention to is that we successfully advocated for cameras on the special education buses, and we just want to thank you as a school committee for supporting us with that. It's just, it's a wonderful thing, and we are very relieved to have them. Um, we also just recently voted to establish a CPAC activity account with the schools in the city so that we can begin some fundraising. Uh, this is very new. Nobody's ever done that before that we know of in uh, Greenfield, and so we're excited to be officially uh, ready to start some fundraising this spring. Um, we are having a family resource fair on Tuesday, April 21st, during April vacation at the Greenfield High School in the cafeteria and that great big hallway in the back. And we are very excited to be inviting um, human service providers from all over the area, as well as anybody else that might um, have some information that could help out our families in our community uh, to have a table. And we're hoping to get a lot of uh, media attention and a lot of advertisement and get a lot of families out here because there are so many families who don't know what's out there that could be benefiting their kids. Uh, so we've started to advertise that. We've already gotten a handful of responses from providers saying, yes, we want to be included in that. Um, and we would like to, t to draw attention to the fact that we have a wonderful and strong working relationship with our Director of Pupil Services. He has been just fantastic to work with, and very supportive and very open. He's got a, a, an open door policy for us and we appreciate that very, very much. Nope, you can. Oh, thank you. All right, so um, we have uh, enrolled in the Mass Pack. Um, so we have a membership in the Mass Pack. Apparently we have a fancy membership in the Mass Pack. Thank you to uh, Matt. Um, <clears throat> we've been promoting our CPAC uh, lending library. These are things that are ongoing activities that we've been working on. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we're going to try to do is make our lending library a little bit more mobile for some of the events that are happening and, um, and that kind of thing. So we're going to continue promotion of that. Um, we are working on getting a parent's rights training, and I believe that our preference was March and our second... Uh, our second um, choice was in February in the hopes that we would skip some of the snow. Um, and so uh, we'll have a parents' rights training um, and I believe that we chose the theme of understanding your IEP um, as being sort of the focus um, in addition to just the parents' rights. Um, we have new CPAC flyers this year. We have flyers that are like trifolds, um, and they have a bunch of information on them. Um, and then we also, so we have pamphlets and we have flyers. And they're a little bit more eye-catching and a little less like full of words so that maybe we can get people to um, sort of recognize that we have hopefully a really big um, part in our community and in our schools and stuff. So And our children's pictures are on them. Yes, um, and they've been translated from um, English into Spanish and Moldovan as well. Um, we have a new improved website. We met over the summer um, with Matt to go over all different fancy things. We have our minutes up there. We have our um, we have our resources and our flyers and uh, links to websites, links to resources, things like that. Um, and we also have a very active Facebook page as well. So if anybody, uh, special ed parent, wants to join the Facebook page, just let us know. Um, yeah, and just really quick, um, we do have, we finally at the end of last year um, managed to like get our email set up so that we can get emails from there. We found it, we got it, passwords, all sorts of fancy stuff. Um, and we've actually had uh, parents that are going to be new to the district reaching out to us and asking about 
um, the special ed in the district and stuff like that and looking for people to, to kind of confer with and talk to. So, uh, so that's kind of exciting, actually, like kind of being known. So anyway, okay, goals? <laughs> Okay, um, things that we are hoping to accomplish before the end of the school year. Uh, we have a number of speakers and trainings that we're lining up. Um, ABAS is a behavior um, specialist, uh, behavior therapist agency in Amherst that a number of our parents receive services from, and so we're ha hoping to have them come and talk about what they do and who they can um, reach out to. Uh, we have a connection with the past human rights specialist from the Department of Developmental Services uh, to come out and speak to us about hu human rights for people with disabilities, specifically how it pertains to our children and us as parents, because we sometimes think we're the mom, so you don't have rights, <laughs> but that's not the case. Um, we, uh, uh, we're going to be talking to Whole Selves, which is um, a division of Pathlight, and they have been doing trainings with parents and children of um, sexuality and um, all of the many categories around that that uh, we co are concerned about our kids in particular because they're more vulnerable than um, most of the mainstream children. And uh, we're also asking each of these people to come to the Family Resource Fair and have a table. Um, we are looking forward to facilitating discussions about <laughs> evacuation plans and safety plans, specifically for our kids and the kids who are, uh, have reduced mobility in wheelchairs or just aren't very quick on their feet. Um, we have scheduled a family film fundraiser in June with the garden, and um, the new owners are honoring that. We're very grateful for that. And uh, we have yet to decide on a film, but uh, if you have any ideas in the summer, please let us know. Um, our building liaison program, which was very successful last year, changes, of course, because children grow and change from school to the next school or families move or whatever. So uh, we want to further promote each school building in our district having a parent who is the CPAC liaison. So when a uh, another parent is concerned, uh, the principal can say, well, um, Crystal Zimmer is our CPAC liaison, why don't you connect with her and she can tell you all about the CPAC. Uh, we would like to continue to improve growth and engagement in both the school community and the community at large. Um, we are, want to improve connections with staff and administration. We want to invite more of the staff and the administration to come and attend our, our CPAC meetings to speak to us and to also listen to us to s when we want to speak to them. And we want to make our meetings and our events more accessible. Um, we're looking into things like Facebook live streaming and um, how to do that and still maintain privacy, um, but have people be able to access the trainings if they're not able to be there physically and in person. Um, a lot of our parents have trouble getting out at night. Uh, some of our parents don't drive or don't have cars. Uh, we want to be able to reach out to them. We last year had a CPAC meeting at Leiden Woods and also one at Oak Courts, and we'd like to continue to do that and also uh, go to um, Greenfield Gardens and try to connect with parents you know, where they live, where it would be more convenient for them. Um, so one thing that's not on there, but um, we know that some of you guys are outgoing, um, that we're gonna have a new, you know, variety in our school committee. So we did wanna thank you guys so much for all of the support that you've done, the cameras and the buses, the, um, the vote to increase the IA um, stuff that we're still working on, um, pushing forward at the city level. So. Um, we did want to tell you that we very much appreciate that and yes. um, we're very excited. Um, one thing that we uh, talked about was, um, and I'm sure that the new fellows and, and ladies and people and such that are going to be on the committee um, are hopefully watching because we are, um, we're really interested in seeing how we can become a really good advisory council for the school committee because that's what we are. Um, we are an advisory committee, so 
um, how can we open up that line of communication a lot more. Um, there is a there is a bill that they're trying to pass at the state level to try to have a CPAC member be a um, be a non-voting member of the school committee to really keep that line of communication open so that we can um, have a really strong voice. Um, we have Susan, who's who is part of our uh, our CPAC club prior. Um, she's been awesome. Uh, so anyway, so any way that we can really work on that sort of relationship between us um, would be really great. So that's something that we're really hoping to also foster this year. Um, so yeah. And we welcome any suggestions. Yes, totally welcome any suggestions. So I, uh, yeah, um, there, there's a few things that we're hoping to kind of push for as we get towards the budgeting time period and whatever. So any, you know, any ideas on, on how we can work on getting those ideas across? Um, I know we agreed that we would speak maybe twice a year, once in the beginning of the year, once in the end, but, you know, any other times would be good. We'll talk in public comment. Is okay? Super. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, Thank you. a more official level. So, yeah. So let us know. Thank you so much for um, coming today. I see the superintendent just raised her hand. Do you want to go ahead? I just want to thank all of you for your advocacy on behalf of your children, but also all of our district's children, and for um, the steady presence that you've had in including more and more families into that umbrella and making them aware of the importance of the advocacy on behalf of children with all different disabilities and for really accessing the services. Greenfield has really made a commitment to the wellness of our students and uh, to really expanding services. And I think your advocacy, talking about Facebook Live and ways to really get to parents where they are is really terrific. And just please know that in addition to your dialogue here and your dialogue with the director, um, you all have been great about coming forward directly and, and that communication I hope will continue and grow as well. So thanks. Any comments or questions for the CPAC? Yes, Member Johnson. I guess just to echo the appreciation, um, parents do the most important work in the world and they aren't paid a cent for it. And then if you have a special needs child, you're working twice as hard. And then in addition to that, you're volunteering your time to play this advocacy role and educate us, educate the community, support each other. And I really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, so much for saying that so nicely. I feel like you really just um, clearly stated what I was thinking too. So thank you so much for that and thank you to all of you and it's been really great to watch you do your work and see the progress and um, I'm excited. I'm excited about what's to come. Um, all right, okay. thanks very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm so proud of you guys. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so, perfect. So our next business item is the English Language Learner Parent Advisory Council update. And there is a one page sheet in your packet. Um, and I do believe we are looking for a motion to approve the establishment of a Greenfield um, LPAC, that's the uh, English Learner Parent Advisory Council um, with the purposes consistent with MGL 71A 6A. Um, is there a motion to approve the establishment? So moved. Moved by Member Johnson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Karen. So um, I'm just being a little formal. We're opening with the motion. Um, Director Holloway, if you want to speak to this. Yeah, happy to. Thank Perfect, you. thank you. And, and thank you for the motion. That was, that was very smooth. <laughs> so um, this, is, this is sort of the beginning of, a, of another parent advisory council that is um, mandated by the state, but also I think a really great opportunity for <clears throat> us to engage in uh, conversation and, and relationship building with uh, our parents. So, so the, the district has um, 
around 100 students who are English learners. So it's a little over 5% of our student population. Um, and that means that we are, we are obligated to create this council. Um, I, I think that the, the vision for the LPACs is similar to the CPACs, that there's a, a working relationship with the immediate district staff. Um, there's sort of an, an, uh, br an advisory function to the school committee and, and sort of um, it's, it's a group of parents who can bring insight into the uh, education of, of students who are often, um, who, have unique, who have unique learning needs, obviously. So we did have a, a session on November 20th. Um, it feels a little strange to be up here speaking about a parents group without parents, but we're just sort of at the beginning stages of this um, and trying to get an awareness out there about, about the, the requirement and the opportunities that are, that are in the LPAC. So November 20th, as you see in, the, in this letter, um, we, we invited uh, all the parents in the district to, to attend, provided childcare and food at Greenfield High School, um, and we, we had uh, four, language, four languages represented. I thought about doing it as a guessing game, like which four languages do you think they are? Um, decided not to, but, but you know, our, our highest incidence language is Spanish, followed by Russian and, and um, Romanian, and then, and then we have a handful of other, other languages in the district too, and it's just it's a testament to sort of the rich, um, the rich diversity that we have in our district, linguistic, cultural, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, so it's an exciting, it's an exciting time. We, there is the, the presentation from that session is posted on the LPAC website. So folks can go visit that and check it out and, and get a sense for um, what this constitutes and what the opportunity looks like. Is the website just the gpsk12.org, is it slash LPAC or maybe under It, it is under family, families and communities community? under okay. that tab. It's, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Superintendent, any comments? Any comments, questions? Okay. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> I would imagine that it's very difficult to coordinate this meeting just based on sort of the language difficulties and needs for uh, translators and things like that. So how is it, the, how, are we, how are we handling that? <laughs> You are correct. It is, it is difficult to coordinate, but but not that difficult. Um, we have two. We have a fabulous uh, Spanish translator in the district who does amazing work, um, and a fabulous Russian Romanian translator. And mm -hmm. the truth is, in a community that's as, as small and tightly knit as this one, the two of them and and then sort of their um, their immediate circles are great conduits for communication with families. So you know, yes, we'll put out a massive email blast and do the sort of the robo text message, but. At the end of the day, it's kind of you know asking them to just spread the word and, and right. get some attendance. Um, in terms of having multiple languages being translated at once during the session, I think you know you, as a presenter, and, and I, I presented the first one, but we also had um, two of our ELL teachers at the session, and, and um, we had some fabulous stu student volunteers helping out too. Um, as a presenter, I think you just have to learn the ebb and flow of you know having multiple languages going on at once. Yeah. Super. Thanks. Okay, are we ready to vote? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. That is unanimous, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next item is a special education out of district placement update. Um, I don't think that we have anything in our packet that corresponds to this. Did you wanna speak briefly to that? Yeah, and, and I do apologize. I didn't realize that this was being requested until uh, I was a little too late to get something in. So I'll, I'll speak verbally to it and obviously can answer questions and um, can provide additional materials. And before you do, I just, uh, I think that, you know, in the past, the school committee has requested a little bit of extra information about special education at this time of year, in part to prepare for budget conversations. So I would just encourage um, the continuation of this conversation, which I think will naturally happen um, it, with the new committee. But go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so so I'm going to do a, sort of an update on the out of district placements in FY20, which is the current fiscal year, um, and welcome questions and, and guidance too in terms of what what areas uh, folks really want to hear more about. So um, in in FY19, last school year, we had uh, th approximately 30 stu 37 students in out of district placements. Um, that number, as you all are aware at this point, ebbs and flows. Um, you know, students have, these are complex circumstances. Many of these students are, are involved in um, uh, the DCF system, DMH, DDA, a number of various um, systems. So 
I counted 12 out of our current out of our current student group who are involved in those systems, and and it's, it can be a, a surprise um, to, to us as we try to plan for those moves. So we had 37 last year, roughly, um, and as of today, we have 37 students who are in sort of confirmed full year out of district placements in in private special education schools or separate day schools, which is public or private. Um, of those, you have those 37. Then we have. Um, I'm aware of four students uh, for whom we're fiscally responsible that are in DCF custody that, are, that do not yet have a confirmed placement, but, but, will, but will soon in the next month or two. Um, I'm aware of, well, no, we have, we have three students who are in short-term placements. That's something that happens when um, the school-based team needs to get more evaluative information about a student um, or other circumstances uh, call for that. And then we have one uh, current referral, <laughs> referral in the pipeline. Um, do you want do you want, do you want to hear more about the programs or what 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 should guide me in how you want to hear the report? Member Action, go ahead. I'm actually curious. Is there uh, does something stand out for of the groups of these people? Is there something that stands out as the reason they are not within our district? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So. So I did a, a breakdown, just sort of number of students by program, you know, as that, as that goes. Um, and I counted the following uh, separate day schools as therapeutic schools. So the Center School, uh, Cutchins, uh, Mill Pond, Neary, Springdale, the Walker Center, several schools. So, and I kind of said, all right, well, that's the category of therapeutic schools, bearing in mind that a number of those, a number of those schools are quite some distance from here and the students might be in a placement that's near the school but we're fiscally responsible because their their parents still live here or, or something like that. Um, so, so I counted 18 of our current 37 students as being in a separate day school to meet their therapeutic needs. So it's, it's, a, glaring, it's a glaring need and, and um, as you all know and we, we spoke about this before we have um, therapeutic programs at the elementary, middle, and high school level, but but frankly, there, it's just not it's just not enough. Um, it's those programs are hard to staff, um, and and you know it, it take it takes a lot to to run those, and we still don't have in in some cases we literally don't have physical space for the number of students who have intensive therapeutic needs. And so, what is someone with therapeutic needs? What would that person be? Right. Or who would that? What would that mean? What would that look like? Uh, meaning someone that we right. are are placed somewhere else due to therapeutic needs. What does that mean, sort of, in yeah. way yeah, terms? Yeah, I, I got you. I think um, it it is. I have to be careful about painting too broad of a brush, you know, because the reasons why we have maladaptive behaviors are varied. Um, but in a nutshell, what I when we're thinking about sort of the the special education eligibility for a child, you know, there's their they become eligible for a number of categories. And the category of emotional impairment tends to, you know, that tends to lead towards a student needing therapeutic supports, whether or not it's a full-on school or program. You know, in general, a student with an emotional impairment tends to need therapeutic supports. Um, also, students who've been exposed to trauma, whether or not they have a, a disability per se, but that trauma history lends itself to needing therapeutic supports. Um, and, and honestly, I have to say that uh, in, in my experience, um, students who have uh, attention disorders, oftentimes, you know, that leads to maladaptive behaviors, which kind of escalate, escalate, escalate. Um, so that's, I think that's another group. It's a smaller portion, but it's another group that we have to be mindful of as well. Yes, sir, Martin. Uh, yes, sir. Do we have, um, most of our out of district are Eastern Mass rather than Western Mass based? No. You? No, they're mostly Western Mass? Correct. Okay, are there any um, multiple diagnosis type places that uh, take care of children? That is a, that's a good question, and that's a hard slot for us to fill in this, in this region, in, in Western Mass in general. There are, I mean, there are, uh, there are substantially separate schools for kids with, for students with multiple disabilities in our region. There aren't many of them, and, um, and, and that, that can be challenging because then, as you well know, um, some of these students who have really specialized needs wind up attending residential programs. Some of those residential programs are, 
cost shared with, with DCF or with um, other, usually DCF. Um, but, but in general, um, the, the, the intensive needs programs in our area are, are a little bit thinner in terms of, of what we have to choose from for our families. Um, but but we, do have, we do have options, and let's see, I'm, I've got my list here, and I, again, I wish I had it in front of you. Um, so one, two, I mean, I really, I really only count two, two placement, two separate schools that you could drive to. You could live in Greenfield and have a daily bus to that right. would serve you if you had really significant disabilities. Do you see any um, financial assistance coming with the uh, passage of the Student Act? Well, I think um, they certainly made another commitment to trying to fully fund Circuit Breaker uh, at the full 75% reimbursement rate. I think the last I heard was in the closer to the 71% range, but, but you mm -hmm. know, it's still substantial. Um, and then I know that, uh, I think it was two meetings ago, this committee discussed the, the gradual, well, I don't know if it was discussed, but um, the big news is that Circuit Breaker will now start to account for some of the transportation costs uh, of, of out-of-district special ed. Mm -hmm. that, that announcement just came out today, actually, and several people asked, well, what does that look like? How do, you, how do we actually account for that? Because, you know, um, especially here, obviously, with our dynamic system, um, accounting for, it's not as simple as sort of we sign a contract with one of a half dozen vendors and, and then, you know, we submit the bill to the state. Now it's going to be that we'll have to account for the cost of our, of our internal staff, mm -hmm. and, and et cetera. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about that is that's a phase-in process. I just want to be clear that next year, um, the reimbursement rate for, for transportation, I believe, starts at 20% and then goes up, or maybe it goes up very, very progressively. So we're not going to be looking at a huge windfall in the first couple of years of, of this new um, right. uh, formula. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Uh, one more question. We have, uh, you've got, you said it's 37 OOD or out-of-district students now, um, just a slight increase what, seven or eight from last year. Um, so you must be filtering through the uh, current student population to find the right environment for that uh, for teaching model. Do we have any others in the system where we're expecting to move to another uh, residential or out of district school? So, I mean, the, the number right now is the same as it was last year, 37 and 37. Um, um, yeah, well, like I said, we have one referral in process as we speak. Um, there's these 45-day placements. The, the goal is always that we can assess them and hopefully they can stabilize and return to us. That's sort of why these placements mm -hmm. are set up the way they are. But, but you know, in reality, sometimes we realize that that's a, that is a better place for them. Um, and, and I don't know. I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fine, you know, it's a fine, it's both an art and a science. It's sort of, you know, you don't want to say, well, this, I think the student is heading towards an out of placement. That's, mm -hmm. it's illegal for us to sort of say, you know what, that, that kid is on his way out. I mean, we really, we really can't take that stance with students. We have to sort of meet them where they are, and, and then teams have to make a determination of, you know, where they can be best served. Um, but, but, you know, typically we do try to budget for, you know, some outplacement, some surprises, mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully some recaptures, too. And I will take a moment. Um, we recently hired a new assistant director at the high school. Um, she, was the, she was the lead at NERI, which is one of the therapeutic schools here. Um, she's been doing a really great job of getting a lot of the students with sort of therapeutic needs um, uh, supports, and and she did just bring the first Neary student back to us back. At starting next next week. So um, that that felt like a good. <coughs> it's in in the big picture of this budget. I know it's it's not it's not always huge, but it's it's the direction that, that I think the district wants to go. Right. Thank you. Did you want the but any kind of budget information now, or or is that something for a later meeting? Um, I think I might have seen movement towards a comment. Is that accurate? <laughs> um, so let's take this question first, and then we'll go from there. Member Hollins. I had two questions, Matt. Um, one was, at what time of year do you have to submit the data that allows us to get circuit breaker reimbursement? When, when do you have to compute that and get it in? I believe the circuit breaker is technically due in mid-May, but they usually put the forms out quite a bit early and they'll, they'll work with you on a rolling basis. They're very responsive. And the other question I have is uh, whether or not space in any of our schools inhibits our ability to address the needs of students. 
Yeah, very much so. I mean, and not just, right, I think we, we often think staffing because, you know, these students are pretty staff intensive, you know, in, in general, but, but absolutely, um, there is, there is a, so, so the, the separate program, the sub -sep substantially separate programs in our schools that meet these students' needs are generally called the transitions programs. Um, at the elementary level, that's at Federal Street, and it's a, it's a small physical space. And, and yes, absolutely, even if we had adequate staffing, there is, there is a hard limit to how many students can, can safely and, and effectively be in that program. Um, we have, we have uh, class size ratios that we have to follow, as you know, with, at, the high, I mean, that, at the high school level, that becomes sort of an issue because the high school program is a little bit more decentralized. Um, and, and I think the middle school is, is not currently struggling for space, but if you would have asked me that this time last year, you know, that middle school program was, they were, they were at sort of at capacity in terms of physical space. Uh, I'll also say too that, you know, it's really, it's really complex work to, to embed this kind of programming into the life of a school. Um, and so even if you have enough physical space, the, the flow of students through the hallways, the lunch, you know, what kind of lunch opportunities do I have? What's my PE opportunity? Things like that. Those are, those are really difficult to, to manage when a student needs to be in a, for, for their own safety as well as of others, they need to be in a smaller, you know, kind of more, more controlled therapeutic space. You know, that can be hard when, when they still, you know, they still have to be able to um, move throughout the, throughout the school. I actually just want to help Matt a little bit with that answer. I know, keep in mind that the larger class, classroom size or ASS class, things like that, that were at the middle school have now moved to the high school. And uh, the room that my daughter spends a few hours in every day, I know that there's not enough room in there. And there are not enough computers and there are not enough number of things, and in part due to staffing, but also because there isn't space. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a balance of the staff, the space, the schedule, the student profile, the program. Um, it's, but absolutely, there, there are some, um, some programs at the high school that are at their limit in terms of staffing and space. Any other comments or questions for Matt? Okay. Um, you had offered to give us some budget numbers if it's yeah, it may be helpful to send to the committee if you if you have that in a nice, you know, format for that. Then we can actually take a look at it. Um, great. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much, and we'll look forward to that information. Uh, we are set to go into executive session at 7 p.m. Um, I'd like us to move on to item number five. This is an update on the DESE audit. I requested this from the superintendent to give us an update on that. That was a, by vote of the committee, we requested an audit from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. That was several months ago. Um, the school district has been working in, together with the city um, on that. So superintendent, do you have an update for us? So this matter is still pending. The um, contact that we've been working with at the Department of Education is Jay Sullivan, who's widely regarded as the sort of finance expert at the Department of Ed. And on the city side, the finance director and other uh, city um, employees have been working to draft and propose a potential cost sharing agreement with the schools that we could look at as part of our budget planning process to better understand how we can uh, collaboratively move forward with a clear plan. Uh, and I think when that um, uh, is further along in the draft process, the Department of Education can look at that as well with advice um, for bringing together a sort of ideal cost sharing agreement between the city and uh, school department expenses recognizing that Chapter 70 is slated to increase uh, funds coming into Greenfield, it will be important to address both of those sets of needs um, while keeping funds in the classroom as has been identi identified as a priority of the mayors as the, at the last meeting, keeping uh, classroom funds available to students in the classroom. Are there any comments or questions on this item? Mayor Martin.
Thank you. Um, I'm not aware of any any um, communications between the city of Greenfield and Desi, in particular Mr. Sullivan. Um, he was assigned to us <clears throat> early on about four or five months ago. It was suggested that we all sit down, the city, the school, and Mr. Sullivan from uh, De Desi. And uh, I think the, the Chair Nunez decided that it wasn't necessary or the superintendent at that time. Um, I know we've been accurate. working on- Mayor Martin, that's not accurate. Okay, why didn't we meet with Mr. Sullivan? I did not determine that we did not need to meet with Mr. Sullivan. We had so a part date. of the reason why this is here today is to have an update on the status of this DESI audit. So I'm asking the superintendent for any additional information. So it takes it must take two groups to meet, and you can have the perspective from this group, which is the city. Um, we've been in touch with DESI. We have some clarification of the the uh, focus of the audit, which was the net school spending. Uh, and to the um, finance director for the city and the business manager and occasionally the superintendent have discussed the potential of uh, an MOU, a memorandum of understanding that will specifically address the net school spending expenses that the city um, provides for the school department. Uh, that's been done. It's a, by, it is by law that it is a, given to the uh, Office of Department of Revenue and um, the additional funds expended from the state legislature with the new law, if it should be surpass what we currently receive, are dedicated to educational expenses for the city. So I think to, um, to say otherwise that all of the funds go to the school department is, is not quite accurate. So uh, let's keep this on topic. We're not talking about anyone saying anything otherwise in this moment keeping right it now. to the topic of the desi audit which is on the agenda the desi audit currently shows that the city of greenfield provides 5.9 million dollars over the formula and even with the new calculations our net school spending will be uh, over and above what is required by law and what is uh, required or and compared to a number of other districts across the area uh, very so generous. it sounds to me that uh, you rephrased some of what the superintendent noted, which that there will be review of the ag agreement between the city and the schools, and that there is additional work that needs to be done, and that new school committee is going to look forward to a report on the DESI audit. Yes, superintendent. I, I do just want to clarify that, uh, as far as I'm aware, and I, there are no communications that I've been involved in that have challenged net school spending. So Greenfield is above net school spending, which is just the minimum requirement that uh, you need to contribute towards education, and Greenfield has met that obligation. And that's through a combination of the expenses that are direct on the school side and indirect costs, like in employee insurance. Uh, if you have a teacher in the classroom, there's a cost to their benefits. And that cost is also part of net school spending. So the net school spending was not um, in question, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and that there's there's no sort of charge that that wasn't uh, in place. However, what we're looking at is how best to uh, utilize the funds that are available through the Chapter 70 money, and how uh, that agreement between the city and schools can benefit the strategic planning process, which will benefit students in Greenfield, residents in Greenfield, municipal officials, school committee officials, and help us preserve a long-term relationship that lets everybody budget for uh, the best possible outcomes. Okay, so we are about four minutes away from seven. I'd like us to take a four-minute recess and then reconvene in executive session. Um, let's uh, move to enter into executive session for a purpose Number one of MGL C30A21 to discuss the reputation, character, physical condition, or mental health rather than the professional competence of an individual or to discuss the discipline or dismissal of or complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual. This is in relation to Director of Pupil Services and Principal of Newton School. Um, I move that. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Ekstrom. Can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Martin? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Member Ward? Yes. Member Karen? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Nunez? Yes. Myself, we are unanimous. 
Okay, so um, we are going to take a very quick break and meet in the other room at 7 p.m. Um, we hope to return to public session at approximately 8 p.m. So we are, will do our best to stick to that time frame. Thank you. Thank you, GCTV. Thank you, everyone. We are back from our executive session. It is um, 8.40, and whew, thank you for your patience. Um, I have, our next agenda item is, needs uh, a little discussion with the superintendent who is um, coming here shortly. So I'd like to uh, skip to number eight, unless there's any opposition to approve, to release into, uh, to release executive session minutes into the public. Um, earlier this evening, we did review several executive session minutes. Um, and at this time, the school committee is prepared to release um, multiple years worth of executive session minutes into the public. I will read um, off from the list that will be moved to the public. So the motion is um, uh, move to approve the following executive session minutes for release to the public having been reviewed and redacted by legal counsel and because they no longer warrant non-disclosure under the open meeting law, the following executive session minutes of the Greenfield School Committee. Year 2013, October 9th, November 6th, November 13th, December 11th. Year 2014, January 29th, February 20th, July 2nd, July 30th, September 10th, October 8th, November 12th, and December 10th. Year 2015, February 11th, February 23rd, March 11th, March 17th, April 8th, May 13th, May 28th, June 10th, June 20th, June 25th, July 6th, September 9th, December 9th, December 30th, year 2016, January 13th, February 10th, February 24th, the minutes Oh, March 24th, May 24th minutes listed as revised, June, 20, June 8th minutes listed as revised, June 15th, July 13th, August 10th, September 14th, September 22nd, November 9th, year 2017, January 11th, April 18th, May 30th, June 14th, and October 11th, and year 2018, February 14th, February 28th, and March 12th. Is there a second? Second. Second by member Ekstrom. Everybody else set on this? Yeah. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that is unanimous. Thank you, so we have just released significant amount of executive session minutes into the public, and we will um, proceed back to item numbers six and seven on our agenda this evening. Um, the first is, FY21, Budget Development Goals and Direction. Um, I had this here as a conversation starter. Um, 
I'll yield to the superintendent as to any comments she wants to provide at this time. I don't believe that the committee is prepared to have a robust conversation about FY21 budget development goals at this time. We also will experience a transition of the committee um, in a couple of weeks. Superintendent, would you like to make a statement related to this? No, I understood this to be, as you indicated, Chair, a conversation around the committee's goals and priorities. Um, certainly, it's helpful to have advanced planning as we head into the budget process. Uh, the only thing I would say at this point, because this is the last meeting scheduled of this iteration of the committee before we uh, welcome new members on, and I think it behooves us to have uh, the new members that will be sitting through the budget deliberation, have a lot of input into the budget, uh, but I do ask that the goals and priorities are aligned to both the superintendent's goals, the student outcomes that you want to see happen uh, in the coming year, and that we are um, continuing the work that we talked about earlier around cost sharing between uh, the, the school department direct expenses and the indirect expenses on the city side, that those all be a robust part of the conversation early uh, because they're, uh, they provide planning and useful information that can help us drive student achievement in the district in a really powerful and positive way. So I look forward to this year's uh, budget conversation. Member Ward. I'd like to see uh, the budget subcommittee brought back. I maybe make a motion to uh, to bring back the budget subcommittee. Second. Um, is there conversation on this, Member Hollins? I didn't know that Member Moore was going to make that motion, but prior to this meeting, I went through the agenda of every meeting of uh, starting at this fiscal year because one of the reasons it expressed for why the budget committee was disbanded was that it talked about inappropriate items from its charge. Um, today I just got a new certificate in education finance and there isn't one topic of any agenda that was not on point and that we have, there is no way to have the kind of conversation about what's in a budget, whether you call the school committee association, the business managers association, the state auditors, or a national education finance planning group like I was just a part of. Everyone says you have to know what's in the budget and to talk about different ways you can plan things because everybody's stressed uh, we haven't had any level of conversation about budget that gets into any detail and i think it's a disservice to the community to not have a budget subcommittee where we're using the majority of tax resources for the whole town it has to be more than cursory and and what the state association of school committees says is there's no question about the budget that's out of bounds for a school committee you ask whatever you want. You should absolutely know what's in your budget and give guidance. So I think we should. We're, it's a disservice to the community not to have a subcommittee. If there's problems with it, bring them to the school committee. So um, I would like to remind the committee that uh, we made a motion, we decided, we made a decision to disband that subcommittee until the end of the calendar year. So that was in part because of the level of functionality of the committee at the time. The committee voted on that. It That time limit essentially is about to be up. So I personally feel uncomfortable with directing a new school committee to form a budget subcommittee. However, I highly recommend it. I also agree that with the new configuration, it may be very helpful for the new group to have a budget subcommittee, especially starting off in budget season. It's going to be important for there to be in-depth del deliberation and understanding of the budget, especially with the new members. So that's where I stand with it. Um, I saw Member Johnson's hand over here. Member Ward, in, in light of that, I wonder if you'd accept a friendly amendment to make it a recommendation to the next school committee that we form a budget subcommittee? Sure. 
Okay. Either way, I think that it's important that you have it. It's too bad that we have it for so long. And Member Hans, I think you were a second. Is that okay with you? Okay. Um, any additional conversation on that? Yes. In our new policy packet for uh, modifications, did we change the um, structure of subcommittees? No. We, we didn't. Good. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor of recommending to the new committee that they form a budget subcommittee? Aye. Aye. That is unanimous. Thank you. Um, related to budget development goals, I'll just say that um, I would very strongly recommend to the new committee to please continue to preserve the many options that we have for our students here in Greenfield and protect the availability of um, sports and clubs um, and electives and arts and music uh, here at the Greenfield Public Schools. That is a tremendous point of pride for me. So please do keep that in mind moving forward. Um, as well, um, I would, I'll leave it at that um, in terms of my own personal recommendation and maybe I'll show up for some public comment in the future. Is there any uh, other conversation related to FY21 budget development goals and direction? Yes, Member Ekstrom. Um, I actually would like to have the tenor of the discussion around budget change. I would prefer that we discuss things that we are going to do rather things that we are rather than things that we are going to cut. I don't want to cut anything. I want us to figure out how to make it happen. And so my wish is that when we first get the budget from, or the superintendent submits her budget to us for discussion, that there would be no cuts in it at all so that we can all see really what it would cost to do the things that we need to do. Thank you. Um, yes, Member Hollins. One of the things that has come up each year in budget subcommittee and maybe at the regular committee is the timeline for the school committee having a draft budget. And on, uh, when we discussed that last, the superintendent said if she knew, um, if we would give a date that it would be possible to get a draft, we haven't actually seen a completed budget much before it was submitted to the paper. And could we say that we'd like to see a budget in by the end of January so we have time to look at it? That would be important. Member Johnson. Um, my thoughts on budget going forward. Um, I think it's been said before that budgets are moral documents, and I really believe that. And I, I see in a, the importance of that in particular around looking at special education in our in our district, um, making sure the students have the needs that they're met. And I think in our, um, you know, I've had an education since joining the school committee in May, um, especially through hearing um, members and instru uh, instructional aides come forward and, and talk during public comment about the um, emerging or the the extreme needs that are, that are out there um, that, we need the staff, we need the salaries to be at a level that attract the staff that can serve the needs to serve the students. So I see that as part of our obligation as a school committee to address those issues as part of framing a, a moral document of a budget. I also think what goes along with a, uh, it being seen as a moral document is that the way that we go about creating the budget is also extremely important. And so I echo the concerns or interest in in having a positive frame in terms of focusing on what we want to do. Yeah. I also think that communities are, in, are increasingly beginning to experiment with forms of um, participatory budgeting so that members of the community can be involved. Um, and I don't know where there might be opportunities for, for pilots or experiments with involving the, the community in, a, in a more ways than we have so far, so I think those are some of the ideas that come to my mind in terms of budget going forward. Mayor Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, participatory budgeting uh, is an interesting uh, aspect. Um, we tried it three years ago, and the council decided not to be involved. 
So maybe there's a new council and a new idea uh, that participatory budgeting can occur in Greenfield. Um, I think um, during the budget process, it's important for the school committee members, of which I will not be, um, pinch themselves every once in a while and deal with the schedule that things have to happen by. For instance, uh, March 8th is the time that the school committee's budget approved uh, has to be sent to the mayor so the mayor can prepare the uh, budget for the city council, the entire city budget. It's also um, good to review, since we're almost on January 1st, that the, um, if the superintendent's going to present a budget, she declare so rather than three days before it's published in the newspaper. So a uh, declaratory superintendent's budget is either with the business manager or without the business manager, but it's a superintendent's budget that the school committee members need to vote on. Uh, additionally, uh, there are only so many pies, pieces of the pie, and I think the school committee should um, look closely at how historically the city has funded its operations and how um, uh, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars and look for performance outcomes that would benefit the uh, student population that we're focused on and deal with the sustainability of every budget passed. Um, it's a moral budget, sure, but it's also a realistic budget. And if we don't have the ability to attend to the sustainability of a budget, we have circumstances uh, and a certain amount of um, regret that is passed on to the community when we say we cut a budget when in fact it's really an increase over the previous year. So I think language and communication is very important and if it's going to be a moral budget, let it be a moral conversation with the community. Okay, I think that we don't need a vote on this tonight. So thank you everyone for taking a, t a little time to express your opinion. Um, we'll move on to item number seven, which is the Green River School update. So um, the superintendent was reviewing the Green River School plan that the school committee voted in the past and um, looking to update that plan to meet the needs of students today. Um, Superintendent, would you like to speak to, to the work that you've been doing and how potentially you see this coming into conversation with the new school committee? I would, but I'd like to comment first on the um, <clears throat> indirect criticisms that have been levied in the last comment. I'm very proud of the fact that we have delivered a budget on time every year. I'm very proud of the fact that we have used our budget as a moral document. I'm very proud of the public participation in the budget process. I look forward to working with the incoming members in a budget subcommittee, but I take exception to the implied comments that um, we have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn about our new students, our incoming needs, and responding to the changing environment and changing demands, and continuing to work with our elected officials, and continuing to serve the students that we should have first and foremost. Um, but I think it's important to note that there, there's no uh, finger wagging going on here about mistakes that have been made. All we have in a, is an opportunity to continue to do our best moving forward. As far as the Green River School, this committee has voted on a proposal. The Green River School needs to be opened and needs to be used. We have a commitment to using that building. We have an MSBA reimbursement on that building. Um, and the Director of Pupil Services and myself have been looking at how we can update the proposal that came before this committee and working with the principals in the district to best meet the changing needs of our students. Earlier tonight you heard, for example, that in some of our buildings we could expand in-district offerings, which would be um, legally appropriate, the best way to serve students, and the, also the least expensive way to serve students as opposed to costly placements elsewhere. But we don't have always the physical space in the buildings. So we're looking at creative ways that we can update the um, proposal that came before this committee. Um, that work is ongoing. We're working with a number of community partners and liaisons to continue to update that. And I've been in communication with the chair to let her know the status of that work throughout the process. But the bottom line is regardless of what the program is, which deserves this committee's vote, there needs to be heat in the building. 
um, and <clears throat> my communication with the council has co continued to convey that. The school committee is in charge of the program. The council is in charge of the facility by way of the heating and the order to approve that heating. Um, and so I do think that while this committee needs to continue to refine that in the next month or two so it can open for the fall of next year, we need heat in that building no matter what. Thank you, Superintendent. Are there any comments or questions? Member Hollins. I have a question. Superintendent, um, do you ever see that from elementary enrollment that the school is needed as an elementary school, either fully or, you know, it's a school that has two halves. Uh, sometimes, I just wonder if we have students in that area that need, an, do we need another elementary school? I think that if there were another elementary school in Greenfield, it would be advantageous to us. We have a large uh, incoming kindergarten class. Last year, we have a large young population in Greenfield. Um, and Green River is a beautiful school. However, we've looked at this issue at length with members of the community. And because of the size of that building, it is not very well suited to be a standalone elementary school. Um, and nor would it be very cost effective to run that building as an elementary school. For example, you'd have one kindergarten, one first grade, one second grade, one third grade. You'd have one of everything. But you, if you had one more student enrolled than there was space for in a grade, you'd have to open a whole nother classroom for that student and you would be out of space. Or you'd have to transport that student. So you, as an example, so you may run into some economies of scale there. And because of that, it would also get into the business of redistricting every family in Greenfield. So you would potentially be causing a lot of disruption to the neighborhood schools. Um, and we've been looking for ways to meet an existing need without causing significant disruption to all of the family uh, and neighborhood schools currently in place in the district. People really do love their family, their neighborhood schools. Member Johnson. I don't know the acronym MSBA and what that program is that you mentioned. Could you clarify that? MSBA is the Massachusetts School Building Authority, and when uh, significant repairs were done to renovate that building, uh, including the new roof, windows, boiler, uh, the building is extremely energy efficient at this point, had re asbestos remediation, a lot of work done on the facility, and the, the MSBA program uh, allows a certain um, reimbursement rate to the community so that the majority of the costs of those renovations are paid for by this essentially a grant fund through the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Greenfield applied for those funds and received them through the Green Repair Program. But you commit to continuing to use those buildings for student use um, because you receive those funds or you risk forfeiting those funds. So we are continuing to keep that building in use after the period of renovation, which has just gone through, which means that we need to reopen it once the program is ready to begin. And what is, what's the timeline with the council and what can we do and what can people at home do if they are interested in helping to move that process along of getting the school, the heating going and whatever the council needs to do to get that to happen? I believe it's on the council agenda for this this week. It's on the on council Wednesday. agenda for this week. Yeah. Um, the council is ha holding public comment tomorrow. Um, I will be reporting to the council tomorrow a simple report and essentially summarizing what the superintendent has indicated this evening um, and requesting that they uh, fund the heating system. So if members want to come and make a comment at public comment or send a message to council, I think that that would be a fine way to advocate for moving that agenda item along at the council level. Um, if there's other suggestions, I'm open to that. Um, any other comments, questions for the superintendent regarding Green River School? So there is one um, new business item that came to my attention um, at approximately 4.30 p.m. today. It was a request from Mayor Martin. Some, some members may not have even seen it in their inbox. 
um, but I do want to bring it to our attention. Um, given the timing of this meeting and the winter break, et cetera. So uh, my understanding is I wanted to give the superintendent and our business manager a chance to respond and also formally request the superintendent to provide a little additional information when she has a chance to review um, what has happened. Um, I don't have the email in front of me, so my recollection is that um, in order to, uh, that our business manager, along with our uh, transportation manager, were um, moving forward with the request of the committee to expand our special education transportation fleet. Um, and in that process, we're, we're reviewing, working with um, Greenfield Savings Bank um, to, uh, review an appropriate uh, funding mechanism for this. Um, sure, yeah, please give a summary. And so, the, but just let me finish. The, the mayor sent out an email um, essentially requesting some addressing of this item. So this is, again, new and fresh to the committee at 4.30 p.m. today. If you want to give a summary, um, go right ahead, Steve. Yeah, Thank yeah you. sure. Um, so we had uh, the charge from the school committee to go ahead and procure some more vans, and we wanted to do that under uh, the, um, what the school committee wanted us to do. When we finally got to Lundgren, uh, first of all, the terms were not that great, and second of all, they wanted to charge us 10% interest. I'm not going to pay 10% interest for anything. I'll walk the kids to school for that. Uh, so the Lundgren Honda went to... Um, uh, Greenfield Savings Bank uh, and spoke to them to try to procure financing uh, and so they started working with Greenfield Savings Bank um, then we are just in initial discussions with them uh, we haven't committed to anything we haven't done anything uh, if we move forward uh, that whole financing scheme has to come back to you and it has to be according to what the mayor said uh, so we are working with them. Uh, I, honestly, I have not seen a single piece of paper from Greenfield Savings Bank yet. Uh, so this is extremely premature. But as soon as we get something, it'll come back to you. Uh, and again, we're not paying 10% for anything. That, that is not going to happen. So uh, <laughs> we, we will uh, be in touch. Once we get all our ducks in a row, we'll come back to you with some answers. Thank you, Steve. Um, Superintendent, do you want to add anything? You don't have to. I just again, this this was a request that just came late this afternoon, so we're happy to look into it. But I think, as Steve indicated, it's very um, early in the process, and I think our interest here is following procurement law, uh, working with the city, getting the best terms possible. Uh, I think uh, the initial efforts have been consistent with that. I've personally co been coordinating with the city finance director and procurement on this, so I think. Uh, that that is the spirit of our effort to move this forward. Member Ward. This is for special ed transportation? That's correct. And what are we looking, how many more vans are you looking at? Uh, we're looking at how many vans, Ed? Seven. Seven more vans. Already approved by the committee. Just, yeah. just a note on that, but four of those seven are replaced. Replacing, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Those up planners, the mm -hmm. other three will start. Oh, sorry. Four of those are to replace the uplanders, and it, we're past critical right now on those. I'm real nervous about that part. So we will look forward to additional information from you, if not this committee, then the new committee. That is correct. All right. Um, yes, Mayor Martin. The, um, the reason the communication went out today at uh, whatever time it was late afternoon uh, is because we were notified only last Friday. And of course, Saturday and Sunday, nothing happens. So, um, except we work. The, um, uh, the Friday notification came from uh, Greenfield Savings Bank. And the request uh, was who was authorized to sign a loan for $382,000. So that was quite shocking. Um, <clears throat> So actually, um, for everyone's information, only one person can sign 
borrowing and bonding notes in the entire city. That would be the city treasurer. So um, after hearing that for the first time uh, as a mayor and a uh, finance director for the city, um, we started uh, looking into what was going on. Um, so uh, there, are, there are several things that need to be addressed. Uh, about three weeks ago, I notified the superintendent that all procurement from the school department will have to go through the city procurement office. Um, that is because the procurement um, needs to be compliant with Chapter 30B. Only the designated procurement officer for the city, which is by charter the mayor who may designate, which we've designated several months ago to um, Phil Wortel, uh, he's the designated chief procurement officer, because we have to always be in compliant, compliant with purchasing and procurement. Um, I'm particularly interested in that because the charter specifically states that the mayor, even though he or she may designate a CPO, uh, procurement officer, the mayor is still responsible and accountable. So that's quite concerning when you know, we purchase a lot of stuff uh, as a city. So my first, my first concern is that all procurement needs to go through the city procurement office. Um, and that goes for every department in the city, and it does. If there's any deviation from that, then I'd like to see the legal person and the source of uh, that information. So that's number one. Number two, uh, that's because the school department doesn't have a designated CPO. Number two, um, we were told early on in several meetings um, that special ed uh, purchases are exempt. That is not true. Special education vehicles, special education spe spending is not exempt. Even special education services, which may be exempt, need to go through a very rigorous process. So the purchase of the vans are, um, are for special ed do not go through any exemption. Um, therefore, the, the contract uh, you've had with uh, Lundgren uh, is, is violates 30B. This isn't, Pardon? Yeah. I actually think that we're venturing into potentially executive session no, items. This is public Why? information. How is it how is it not, Bill? I'm not gonna the, the actually have an argument. If there's a pending contract or even the idea of having a contract with someone, then that does first start in executive session. So I've brought this to the table you know, in part because of your request. I think this is important information for the committee to have. We need to be upfront about the fact that there has been a change in what our administrators originally intended was the pathway to um, access these vehicles. And so at this time, we are going to await additional information from our administrators as to how they advise proceeding. and. I also do not recall any conversation about special education vehicles being exempt from procurement law. We hear what you're saying about the procurement officer, and that information has been sent um, and expressed to the school district. Um, Madam Chair. Yes. I object. I object to, um, <laughs> to, to your comments on the fact that this is non-serious. It might seem non-serious no, I didn't. To you. When, did I say that this was not serious? Well, you thought it should go into executive session, and this is all public information. Um, let me start with um, the fact that the, um, the minutes dealing with transportation began uh, in April through November, April, May, June, October, and November. I'll indicate the, um, the current minutes that have been approved. I'll indicate uh, everything I've just said about the... Uh, special exemption for uh, special ed vehicles as well as uh, how to deal with uh, procurement as well as knowing that the uh, you can, nobody can sign a contract beyond three years without going to the city council. Okay. Because we have... We're, we're moving you, away from No, this we're not. We're topic. talking about transportation so. with existing contracts. So we have existing contracts that are five years Point and have order. not gone to the special... Yes. I, I still have I the floor unless somebody is going to uh, stifle continue, continued conversation. Member Johnson has a point of order. What is your point of order, Member Johnson? I, I think we're permitted to deliberate on items that are time sensitive, but I don't think we're entitled to deliberate on items that aren't time sensitive that weren't on the, the agenda in advance of the meeting. If there are any items that aren't 
urgent, I think that we can put them on the agenda for the next meeting. Uh, we won't be here, of course. And uh, this is on the agenda as other business. And I did request uh, to the chair to put it on the agenda as an emergency item. Can you help me understand what the emergency is? The emergency is that the, um, besides the illegal special ed exemption discussion, besides the illegal, uh, I don't mean to use illegal, let's use the terms, uh, violating 30B and the special ed exemption and violating the procurement policies of the city of Greenfield and the state. Uh, in addition, no that violations nobody- violations have occurred. Are you alleging that violations have occurred? Yes. What is I your just, desired outcome is, of that discussion? If you think violations have occurred, what do you hope to happen tonight, Mayor Martin? Um, certainly not to keep it secret, but uh, to expose it in such a way that will uh, explain that I am not being uh, responsible or accountable for these actions okay. as the Chief Procurement Officer. But do you want to talk about what the actions are or what happened? Or is anyone interested? I thought the whole point of this was that the, hearing the superintendent and the business manager saying we're going to do our due diligence, it's unfortunate that Greenfield Savings Bank said something to you. It sounds like they jumped the gun. Nobody's done anything. You on can't go to. Not, if I'm wrong. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we have existing contracts that are in violation. That is. What? Mayor, are you trying to say that the vans we originally purchased this spring were done in violation of this procurement law? I'm saying that what the school committee voted as for the purchase of the vans using the uh, sources of funds specified were not followed. And that there, uh, there are leases for vehicles that are beyond the three-year limit. And that the um, proposal to the bank to refinance the leases is improper and you can't do that. Then that there's also... Um, sources of funds indicated with our most recent vote for the purchase of the vans from specific sources, not from borrowing. Mayor Martin, I think what's improper is your behavior right now. In fact, if our administrators I'm not stand want scolded to by the chair. Thank oh well, you. thank you. I've spent several years being scolded by you. Now, we our administrators were looking for a solution. And it's my understanding that there is no ill intent and that no contracts have been signed. If that is incorrect, please correct me now. That is absolutely correct. Did I see two hands over here? Yes, Member Johnson. Um, a motion for um, to encourage the administration to work with the mayor's office to address any concerns that appear to be had about um, about being out of compliance with any regulations and to consult counsel as necessary to determine if that's the case, that that happened? Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Ekstrom. Yes, Superintendent. Um, so I just want to uh, agree with the spirit of that and, and to reiterate what I said at the beginning, which is there's some information that came by email from the mayor today, this afternoon, and some um, information sort of seeking clarification earlier today uh, by myself uh, having a conversation with a finance director and procurement officer in an effort to make sure we are following the process. I ask that the chair, um, that this matter be referred to the chair so that it could be reviewed appropriately with the support of the business manager, transportation coordinator, and in coordination with the procurement officer. I do think that's the appropriate step to make sure we're doing everything correctly. Having said that, I don't want to jeopardize a relationship with a valuable community partner like Greenfield Savings Bank, like Lundgren Honda, people that are working with us to uh, meet the voted priorities of the school committee and in coordination with procurement officers who want to make sure we're able to do that consistent with the law. So I'm asking this committee to allow us some period of time to just review the matter. We certainly want to be compliant. We certainly want to use taxpayer funds according to the law. And we certainly want to make sure that our transportation is done safely and securely. Those are our goals. So I'd ask that instead of um, sort of using wild language tonight, that we can take a moment to just bring back to the, to the committee a report. And if the chair wishes to uh, 
take any other steps or this committee wishes to take any other steps, that would be fine. And we'll be happy to coordinate as we have been doing uh, with the city officials and follow the procurement law. There's a motion on the table. Um, Susan Farber, could you read back the motion? Thank you. <laughs> to direct the administration to work with the mayor's office to address concerns that appear to be out of compliant regulations and to consult council as necessary to determine if that's the case. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the full motion because I asked the question. I apologize. What, is it council as in legal council or council as in the city council? I have it reported as legal council. Le council with an S. Thank you. Was that your intent? I don't think the motion captured my intent. Can you read it back again, please? That's okay. To direct the administration to work with the mayor's office to address concerns that appear to be out of compliant regulations and to consult council with an S as necessary to determine if that's the case. Um, I think I meant to discuss the mayor's concerns that they there may be um, let me let me try it again. <laughs> so I guess I'll I'll retract that motion and make a new motion. <clears throat> My new motion is, in light of the mayor's concerns about the issues raised tonight, that the administration investigate that the that the administration ensure that they are following the regulations properly and work with the mayor's office to communicate about the issue. It's the best I can do at 920 tonight, you guys. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Ekstrom. Is there any discussion? Bill? Does the motion intend to uh, retrieve information that's uh, derived from the minutes of our school committee meetings? I would accept using the information from our school committee minutes as a as a base of information for the for the motion. Thank you. I'll accept. Any further comment, Member Holmes? I don't completely understand the conversation, but. In the last month, we have received communication uh, that I've read that we may have entered a five-year contract when we can only contract for three, and that we may have been engaged in procurement without a licensed procurement officer. And whatever the issues are there, I think, sh should be included in the pursuit of this motion. <laughs> Yes, Superintendent. So I just want to add one for the request, which is that I've asked for some uh, written procedural clarifications from the procurement office such that we can uh, do an internal review. And it's my understanding from the finance director and procurement official at the city hall that those are in a draft form right now and have not yet been distributed. So as part of this internal review, which I sought out prior to the mayor's email this afternoon, that, they're, um, that we're interested in an internal review, and we can bring that back to the committee once it's received and distributed by the city. Okay, I think it's time to vote. Bill. So the policies uh, regarding procurement are state law. There's no need for internal review. So if there you're compliant with state law, there are no other policies that we would have to review. There are internal procedures, but sure. Okay, it's time It's time to vote. Um, are we clear on what we're voting on? We're getting more information. It's coming back to the committee. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous, thank you. Um, thank you uh, very much for, um, you know, responding to that in short notice, so thank you very much. 
Um, okay, so last closing remarks. Uh, a few of us, this is our, in theory, last school committee meeting. There could be a need for another meeting, but uh, you know, maybe it's our last one. Um, I just want to say thank you to the city of Greenfield. It's been an honor to serve. <laughs> and um, I've learned a lot, and I've been beaten up, and um, we've beaten each other up, and sometimes it's been fun, and sometimes it's been incredibly challenging. And I just want to say that um, uh, it's just been a real honor to fight for our kids and um, for public education here in Greenville, Massachusetts. So thank you very much for that. And if anyone else wants to say anything else, um, thank you all for your service and um, the good times and the bad times. And I wish the new committee the best of luck. Um, Member Johnson. I also want to thank our departing members, um, and I um, appreciate that we obviously don't always agree. Um, I think we do all care about the city and trying to make things go well and are here because we want to play a role in making uh, the city go well, everything involved in the city go well, in particular the schools and our, and our young people. Um, Chair Nunez, I'd like to especially thank you for your leadership. Um, I think that, uh, I met you when you were first campaigning to be on the school committee for the first time, and it was the beginning of a, a great friendship, and I've admired how hard you've worked and um, the leadership that you've taken and uh, how much you've cared uh, and kind of suffered the, the blows that come with leadership sometimes, but kind of kept on trucking, and it's going to be a big loss to the school committee not to have you on, but... Um, but you've, you've well served us and the, and the, the town and the students, um, and I appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate all of you guys. Even you, Bill Martin. And even you, Thank you for Member your Hollins. Yeah, I'd like to say something to the outgoing members and to Adrian. I'd like to thank you for chairing the committee and for your participation. I think you are particularly intelligent and articulate, and I've always admired that how fair and inclusive you are to everyone even some of us that have more to say than others, but you're always, <laughs> <laughs> but you're always polite, and I think you uh, repre represent the school committee well, and I was delighted to hear that you were going back to graduate school in public policy. I, I see a great political future for you, a continuing uh, political future for you, and I, I really have appreciated your work on the committee. And I'd like to say something to Mayor Martin, who probably gets more. I've probably worked with Mayor Martin longer than anyone, because I, when I started in Greenfield in 2008, he was on the city council. And I remember my very first meeting at the city council, he nipped at me. And I thought, wow, why is that happening? I'm trying to be helpful <laughs> here. <laughs> but I have really come to appreciate um, how intelligent I think Bill is and his capacity for numbers. So I'd like to say that, uh, let's see, it's 11 years I've known and worked with the mayor. We need to appreciate that the mayor has really been behind the school system despite anything else. People may think every single facility, including the new uh, $66 million high school, the mayor got in there. Every single building has been updated under his watch. All the safety provisions have been brought in under his watch. He supported arts and electives. Uh, you probably don't know, I send him videos of how you're supposed to repair pianos, and he even has tolerated that and helped to get our piano funded. He helped us get an SRO. You may not know that after t in 2008, all the heat for all the buildings was in the school budget. All the electricity was in the school budget. He's taken that on over at the city. He doesn't talk about that much. All the plumbing was individual contracts. I seem to remember they were 60 to 80,000 each. Um, the electricity, there's a, a lot of expense that has been taken on by the mayor. And 
I just think he um, has really made a huge contribution to education, particularly getting all the facilities updated. They were just all falling apart. So I will miss the debates with the mayor over which enrollment form we're looking at, but I think you've really made a great contribution and kept everyone on their toes, and I will miss uh, working with you, and I want to say thank you. I won't miss those debates, but... Okay, um, signing off for the last time, fingers crossed, um, I move to adjourn. Second by Member Karen. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That is unanimous. Have a wonderful night and a wonderful break, and Happy New Year. <laughs>